Hey everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today we'll be watching Hannibal Part 14, The Battle of Silva Latana by History March. So we've finally moved on from Cannae, that most famous of Hannibal's battles. We've spent the last three episodes in this series looking at the build-up to Cannae, the battle itself, and the aftermath. Now we are finally moving on to a new phase of the Second Punic War. I'm excited to jump in. If you guys end up enjoying this video, I'd appreciate it if you would check out my Patreon, which is linked down below, and will give you access to exclusive content. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, let's jump right into this reaction. Battle of Silva Latana, 216 BC. Part 14. On all August right. 2nd, 216 BC, Hannibal won his greatest victory near the town of Cannae in southern Italy. Yeah. By day's end, his outnumbered mercenaries had destroyed the majority of the largest army Rome had ever put to field. His greatest victory. And now we get to see how Rome recovers from that. I'm honestly really curious because the Second Punic War is not my area of expertise, though I knew a little bit about Cannae. And now I'm excited to see how does Rome make it past that absolutely devastating defeat. I know it was a terrible blow to the Roman psyche, but as we know, Rome continues. I'm curious to see exactly how. Marking this as one of the bloodiest military encounters ever fought. Wow. For the Romans, Cannae became the benchmark by which subsequent defeats were measured. Yeah. It would not be surpassed for another 600 years. Wow. The dazed survivors of the Roman army dispersed. Varro resurfaced in Venusia, in charge of wow. as little as 70 horsemen who escaped the pursuing Numidians. Jesus, truly a horrific defeat. Not surpassed, History March claims, for 600 years. My goodness! At that point, we're talking about the late Roman Empire. Now, of course, by that point, sort of the importance of Cannae would have faded <laughs> from the memories of many Romans. But Cannae was remembered for a long, long time. It was a real psychological scar on the Roman psyche. And there are a couple of battles we can point to throughout Roman history that will inflict that sort of trauma on the Roman consciousness. This is truly one of, if not the worst of those, until, like they said, a long time in the future. In Canusium, a certain 19-year-old tribune by the name of Publius Scipio, together with three other tribunes, gathered a larger group of some 3,000 men. Despite barely escaping the carnage, the young tribune was notable for inspiring the troops going as far as threatening to kill those who spoke about fleeing and forcing the men to take an oath never to betray Rome. Yeah, there we go. So one of the things I'm curious to see in the aftermath of Cannae is how the Roman Republic managed to survive. Another one of those things that we're going to see, one of those characters that's going to become really important throughout the rest of this series is Scipio Africanus, who, as you can see, was at Cannae, apparently served honorably, most importantly, made it out alive. Really, that's sort of the benchmark at this point, with how many people died, how many soldiers, how many important politicians and leaders died at Cannae. If you made it out, frankly, that was good enough. Scipio Africanus made it out, and he's going to become a more and more important player in this story as we continue, so keep an eye on him. <laughs> in the days that followed, up to 10,000 survivors would converge on Canusium, and Varro would resume command. Mm. The question was, what would Hannibal do now? Play that as the most the powerful hero in the world and encounter millions of real players in the world's biggest and most badass mobile game. Raid Shadow Legends. Uh, classic Raid Shadow Legends ad. Uh, you guys know the deal. I will have their video linked down in the description. Go check it out. Go give them a like. And go and check out their sponsor. Basically, show History March some support for making these fantastic videos. Yeah. 
A day after the battle, the Carthaginians were still plundering the two enemy camps, taking 19,300 prisoners. Jesus! Hannibal saw to the burial of his- 19,000, almost 20,000 prisoners. That is a fairly significant sized army of just prisoners, my goodness. His fallen troops and gave Paulus a proper burial. Mm. But the dead Roman soldiers were left to rot in the sun. Uh, God. While more than 50,000 men lay dead or dying in the plain below, the Carthaginian leadership met at a villa in Cannae. I mean, I mentioned this last time, but it feels worth reiterating. Imagine the sight. Imagine, more than anything, the smell from tens of thousands of dead and now very quickly decaying bodies. It must have been a truly horrific thing to experience. Visibly exhausted, they were in disagreement. Hannibal and some of his officers wanted to rest the army and prepare for the campaign in southern Italy. Maharbal, a prominent cavalry commander, was among those who wanted to march on Rome without delay. Yep. And here we go. We get back to the same question. Now, we already confronted this earlier. In fact, at this point, quite a few episodes earlier in this series, should Hannibal march on Rome? Uh, this was a while before Cannae, and the reasons were presented why Hannibal didn't march on Rome. Maybe it wasn't the best idea at the time. Of course, many people have disagreed with that lack of action. Now, after this most impressive victory over the Romans, the Roman Republic is at its absolute lowest. The question re-emerges, should Hannibal march on Rome? Hannibal still leans towards no. He needs time for his army, his men to recover, but others say no. We must take advantage of this victory. We must march on Rome right now, capitalize on our success. Proclaiming, perhaps enthusiastically, that he would lead the Numidians to the capital in five days, he protested to Hannibal, Truly the gods do not give everything to the same man. You know how to win a victory, Hannibal, but you do not know how to use one. Wow. It's a pretty cocky thing to say to Hannibal. And once again, as with most of these quotes, we really don't know if they actually took place. To me, this sounds more like a later construction that was penned to make a point, right? Because this is, frankly, what a lot of people believe about Hannibal. They believe that Hannibal knows how to win a victory, but doesn't know how to use one. Now, the question of marching on Rome. Honestly, we sort of are confronted with the same facts that we were faced with last time. Would March on Rome end the war? It's difficult to tell, maybe, but you gotta remember, the Second Punic War is more than just the Italian Peninsula. You need to zoom out a little bit. We have the action going on uh, in the Iberian Peninsula at the moment. We have the naval action throughout the Mediterranean. And so, maybe it wouldn't end the war. Maybe Rome wouldn't be defeated by that course of action. But, you know, if you're looking at this from, you know, the perspective of the Roman psyche, one might think at this point... Rome has been so defeated that maybe if you march on the capital, take over, they would be willing to lay down their arms and surrender. Now, I know that is an incredibly un-Roman thing to do. The Romans do not surrender. But maybe at this point, they've been so badly defeated that they would. These are sort of the things you have to think about when you're considering, do we march on Rome? Is now the time? Whether or not these words were truly spoken, the reality was that Rome was 400 kilometers away. Mm. Another long march after a grueling campaign had just ended yeah. would be disastrous. I mean, yeah, I think, frankly, regardless of your opinion on what Hannibal should do, his army definitely needs some time to rest. We saw that though the Romans lost far, far more men than Hannibal did, with Hannibal's smaller army... The loss did hit them pretty hard. Also, his men would be absolutely exhausted after this, so Hannibal needs some time for his men to rest up if he's going to make, especially if he's going to make such a long march to Rome. Furthermore, the Senate adopted emergency measures to raise four legions in the coming weeks. 
criminals, slaves, and boys as young as 16 or 17 were conscripted. While insufficient for a pitched battle, these troops would be enough to man the walls of Rome. Mm. Praetor Marcus Claudius Marcellus, previously tasked with reinforcing Sicily, was now sent to bolster the confidence of allies in Campania and wait for the wreck of the army of Cannae to join him. If he were to march on Rome, Hannibal would be placing himself between two Roman armies and would need to fend off relief forces that the Senate would muster over the coming months. To overcome the enemy's vast manpower, Hannibal had hoped for reinforcements from Iberia, but thus far the Scipio brothers had kept Hastrobal at bay. Yep, and this is why I say, when you talk about the question of marching on Rome, you need to zoom out a little bit. First off, there's the logistical and tactical questions at play. Can Hannibal march on Rome? Are his men well supplied enough? And if they can, will they be able to resist all these Roman relief forces popping up? Then you need to conf confront sorry, the strategic questions. <laughs> if Hannibal was able to march on Rome, even if he succeeded, would that win the war? Well, as we can see, the war is broader than just the Italian peninsula. And at the moment, the Carthaginians are not doing so well outside of Italy. Uh, they're not doing so well in Spain in particular. The good old Scipio family, uh, of course we just saw Scipio Africanus back in Italy, but the good old Scipio brothers in Spain are fending off Hasdrubal pretty skillfully. They're allying with some of the local tribes. And so if you look at that front, the Romans are doing a little bit better. So you got to keep all of these in your mind when you're considering what to do. And if you add all these factors up, immediately marching on Rome doesn't seem like such a compelling idea. Not to say that it shouldn't be done at all, nor that it shouldn't be considered, but there are definitely two sides to this debate. Worse, Carthaginian Senate's planning and logistics left much to be desired. Right. Troops in Spain... There's also the fact that Hannibal has really been operating independently in Italy for, well, for years at this point. Uh, he has not received very much, if any, support from the good old Carthaginian government. And Italy were mostly paid by the Barkid family silver. Very little financial support came from Carthage itself thus far. This disjointed system was detrimental to the war effort and in stark contrast to the better organized Roman Senate that mm. strived to secure funding and logistical support for its army and navy in all theaters. Right, and this, and I don't know if this is actually true, but this may be related to the different orientations of each government. Now, if we think about the Carthaginian government overall, or the Carthaginian state, it is far more oriented towards commercial activity. That's what it's known for. It's known for trading and commerce. And so maybe, I know we've had the first Punic War not that long ago, but maybe the Carthaginian state just isn't as well equipped to deal with this sort of conflict, or they don't have the expertise that the Romans do. Now, <laughs> when you think of Rome and what it is known for, it is known for warfare. It's known for expansion, for conquest. I mean, if Rome does other things, of course, but this is really Rome's bread and butter. The Roman government, the Roman state, is absolutely used to this kind of conflict. Maybe not on this scale. Sure, when you're fighting against the odd Gallic tribe, it doesn't get to this level, but they fought the First Punic War, and they are used to this constant conflict and warfare. The Roman state is just better at supplying their men, shifting around manpower, using their armies more effectively on a sort of broader scale. They're more used to this sort of thing. So far, the only attempt to supply Hannibal was a fleet of 70 ships that roamed the waters of northern Italy in the aftermath of the Battle of Trasimene in right. 217. But lack of coordination prevented them from making contact, and many of these ships had since been captured near the port of Cosa. Yeah, we've seen that the Carthaginians have been struggling to supply Hannibal, they've been struggling navally, even while Hannibal has been winning victory after victory after victory, 
Rome has still managed to maintain an advantage in terms of supplying its men and cutting off Hannibal from Carthaginian resupply. Confronted by these problems, Hannibal knew that despite his ability to outwit and surprise his opponents, his army would not endure the many corrosive years in the field without reinforcements and logistical support. Yeah. The decision not to march on Rome was sound. Yeah, and I think that's absolutely right. And we've talked about this before in the series, but we're basically talking about, on some level, a disconnect between tactics and strategy. Hannibal is in a position where he has command of tactics and, to a certain extent, the strategy of his campaign in Italy. But when we zoom out and look at the Second Punic War more broadly, Hannibal does not have command of the strategy. The Carthaginian state does, and they're doing a bad job <laughs> keeping him resupplied. When we look at the Roman state, the Roman government, and its series of generals are sort of necessarily more aligned when it comes to strategy and tactics. Now, part of this is that the Romans don't yet have a figure as transcendental as Hannibal. I mean, Hannibal has really gone beyond what could have been expected. Rome is picking from a wide selection of generals, and they're going through them pretty quickly. So the Roman state really has command of both strategy and, in many cases, tactics. Though, we have seen clashes with the Roman state as well. We can think of the Fabian strategy which the Roman government, especially the senators, were really not in favor of. But the bigger issue was with Carthage, where the Carthaginian state is really just not able to get on board with Hannibal's strategy. While the situation in southern Italy remained uncertain, another Roman army advanced north to punish the tribes of Cisalpine Gaul for siding with Hannibal. The expedition was launched just days after the main army went on its way to Cannae. And just look at the amount of manpower that the Romans have access to, in contrast to Hannibal, who is struggling to scrounge up enough men to keep an army of the size he has. You know, I think he had an army of uh, maybe 50,000 or around that number. A large army, for sure, but Hannibal's struggling to keep that many men. Whereas the Romans, <laughs> you know, you turn a corner, you look at any point throughout the empire, they're bringing several armies together at the same time. They're marching on allies who have betrayed them. You know, the Romans have so many things going at once, so much manpower that they can utilize. As part of the Senate's plan to destroy all enemies in the Italian peninsula in one massive counterattack. <laughs> Commanded by Lucius Postumius Albanus, the Romans marched through the Silva Litana forest, some oh. 120 kilometers northwest of Ariminum. Okay, so that's what we're looking at Albanus today. Albanus was a Roman politician and a veteran general. By now a man in his late 50s, he spent the last 10 years in retirement, but was recalled into service during this time of crisis. He was given two legions, and had recruited allied troops, mustering a 25,000 strong army. With reports of enemy presence further north, Albanus expected to confront the tribesmen in the Po Valley. But the main Boyi force was much closer. They secured the perimeter along the enemy's line of march. The Gauls had cut into the trees in such a way that they would remain standing without assistance, but would <laughs> topple over if given a slight shove. Wow! Talk about an interesting tactic, huh? I don't know if I've ever seen anything like that. I mean, using the environment to your advantage, yes, but also cutting through trees to the point where they don't quite fall, but you give them a little push and those trees are going to instantly collapse. That's remarkable. So this is what this video is about. We've left Hannibal, uh, more in the south of Italy, and now we have Rome versus uh, some of these Gauls, I guess in northern Italy. Uh, we're not quite in the Po Valley yet, if you remember. You know, this is where Hannibal landed and found a lot of allies, a lot of Gallic tribes willing to side with him as he marched south towards Rome. Now Rome is trying to wreak havoc against those same tribes, but... 
they've met them a little bit south of the Po Valley. They're ready, basically. As the column advanced further along the woodland road, the tribesmen pushed the trees onto the enemy. There you go. The trees fell on each other and crashed onto the road from both sides. Now obviously that's going to do some damage to the Roman troops themselves, but also imagine how much of a mess that would cause. I mean, how are you going to make formations or march up and down the battlefield if it's covered with a bunch of fallen tree trunks? Killing Roman soldiers and horses and destroying equipment. Most mm. of Albinus's men died under the weight of the tree trunks Holy. and thick branches. Wow, okay, so <laughs> I talked about the mess it would cause in the aftermath, but never mind that. Apparently the trees falling did enough damage on their own, just to the men of the army. The boy waiting in the forest moved in on the panicked survivors. Roman resistance was fiercest in the vanguard, Right. Elsewhere, the encounter became a one-sided slaughter. Yeah, well, you know, imagine if you're one of the guys right here. You know, you're part of that Roman legion. What are you going to do? <laughs> you were trapped right in the middle. A bunch of trees have fallen around you. You're getting attacked from both flanks. You look in front of you. All you see is more fallen trees and more Romans being slaughtered. You look behind you, you see exactly the same thing. You're screwed. Now, if you're one of the lucky guys <laughs> at the front, at the vanguard, I guess that's the best place to be, because at the very least, you might be able to see an exit path in front of you. If you can get there, maybe some of you can escape. But if not, then you're screwed. Albinus fought to avoid capture but was killed and decapitated. According wow. to legend, his head was later taken to a boy sacred temple where the skin was scraped off and the bare skull was covered Ugh. with gold. It was used as a cup for drinking by the tribe's high priest. A contingent of Roman veterans at the head of the column tried to escape across a river, but were captured by the boy who had already taken the bridge over it. Damn. Very few Roman prisoners were taken. I'm sure. The boy also took a vast amount of loot with the Roman goods handily concentrated along the forest road. Of the 25,000 Romans, only 10 men survived the battle. Huh? Only 10? Are we sure? My goodness. That seems... My goodness. I mean, that seems quite extreme, though, I guess it's, how would any man escape this sort of ambush? Ten men. I'm sure in reality it was a little more than ten, but you get the point. We're basically facing almost a 100% casualty rate. Jesus Christ, talk about getting kicked while you're down. Rome has just fought this disastrous battle at Cannae experienced severely high casualty rates, lost <laughs> a whole lot of its political and military leadership, and now you face this frankly disastrous battle up north. Not as bad as can I, but a really terrible loss nonetheless. Reports of the annihilation in Silvua Litana came mere days after the catastrophe at Cannae. A panic hit the city of Rome. Yeah. The Senate ordered ediles to patrol the streets, open shops, and disperse any sign of defeatism. However, all offensive operations against the Gauls were suspended indefinitely. Wow. Varro was now sent to levy new troops. And so this is the thing, you know, when we saw that Albinus had raised that army, I made this comment about, look at all the manpower the Roman state can levy. This is a massive advantage, but if your armies keep being defeated in humiliating and horrifying ways, maybe you do start to approach this war with a defeatist attitude. I mean, the Senate is trying its absolute best to prevent that. They're trying to keep that Roman strength and determination alive, and because we know how this war is going to go, we know that that Roman determination will survive. But, at this point, I wouldn't blame you as an observer if you said, I think Rome might be done for. 
I mean, sure, they have this strength of spirit and they can levy all these men, but they're facing these horrifying defeats one after the other. Every army they raise gets terribly beaten and demolished. I don't think they can make it much further. I mean, that would, I think, be a fair perspective to have at this time. It looks like things are going real bad for the Roman Republic. ...for the defense of Picenum and Etruria, where he would remain in command of up to two legions and an equal number of allied troops for several years. Mm. Across the Mediterranean, in Iberia, the Romans fared better. Right, right. Astrobal Barca managed to reorganize his forces after the defeat at the Ebro in 217. And, after receiving a contingent of 4,000 infantry and 1,000 cavalry from Africa, he decided to close the distance against the Scipio brothers. All right, look, the Romans have basically been winning out in Hispania. Not necessarily overwhelming victory against Hasdrubal, but they pointed out Ebro. That was a pretty impressive Roman victory. Rome has been gathering allies, so they've been doing pretty well out in Hispania. And Hasdrubal aims to change that, to maybe emulate uh, good old Hannibal, and turn things around. A victory for Carthage. Let's see if he can do that. But some of the officers that he punished and imprisoned for cowardice after the Ebro debacle had escaped back to their homes among the Tertesian people. Uh-oh. They instigated a revolt and captured the city of Asqua, which held a large Carthaginian depot for grain and other supplies. Uh-oh. And hey, it's worth remembering, as we can see here, it's not just the Romans that have a lot of uh, sort of native tribes and peoples to deal with who they have conquered. Uh, if we're talking about the Iberian Peninsula, it's also the Carthaginians. They have a r rather similar issue. Reluctantly, Hasdrubal had to move south and abandon plans to advance across the Ebro in 216. All reports suggested that the uprising had the potential for spreading beyond the Tartasi territory. This would destabilize Carthaginian rule in Iberia, damage Hasdrubal's supply lines, and endanger the safety of the rich copper and silver mines that were vital for the war effort. And we can see one of the disadvantages of fighting in your own territory. Now, we've seen the advantages, you know, turn back to Italy and Hannibal, uh, the fact that the Romans are fighting in their own territory is the only thing that's keeping them alive. Hannibal has had to struggle for resources, supplies, manpower, because he's in foreign hostile territory. But, we can see here from Hasdrubal, one of the issues of being in your own territory is that you actually have to take care of your territory, and if there's a problem that pops up, you need to go and deal with it, and that can take you away from your main objective. Not to mention that the Romans, who here in Iberia are technically in foreign territory, well, they're still getting supplied by the Roman state. <laughs> Hannibal does not have the luxury of that. As we talked about only a few minutes earlier, the Roman state has done a much better job of keeping their men abroad supplied than the Carthaginian state has done with Hannibal. Hasdrubal met Calbo in battle and made short work of the rebel army, despite their large numbers. Around this time, he received news of the victory at Cannae and was ordered by the Carthaginian Senate to march his army to Italy as soon as he could. Oh, wow. He was now too far south and his army needed rest. Most he could do is reach the Ebro River before the onset of winter but it was too late to campaign against the Romans. Damn. For the older Scipios. That's unfortunate. That's unfortunate for Hasdrubal. He had a big opportunity there. Though, of course, one has to ask, even if Hasdrubal had been able to march over to Italy, would he have been able to get past the Scipios? I mean, they've beaten him before. Would they have been able to prevent him from crossing the Alps like Hannibal? This was a window of opportunity they would not miss. Okay. Previously, except for a brief expedition south of the Ebro, they largely stayed north of the river, weary of Hasdrubal's generalship and the vast resources he had at his disposal. 
Mm -hmm. But taking advantage of the Carthaginian general's absence, the Scipios negotiated an alliance with some of the Celtiberian tribes. In addition, they enlisted many mercenaries from their ranks and began preparations to push south across the Ebro next spring. Back in oh southern Italy, a Macedonian delegation was heading towards the Italian coast. Upon hearing of Hannibal's victory at Cannae, Philip V of Macedon wanted to propose huh. an alliance with the Carthaginians. Oh wow, this is something I did not expect we would see. We're getting a bit of international politics. This is fascinating. I mean, when we look at the Second Punic War, of course, we look at Rome and Carthage. These are the two powers in conflict. We're primarily focused on sort of the Western Mediterranean. We often don't turn an eye towards the politics of the East. Uh, and frankly, I don't even know much about Macedonia or the Greek states at this point. So this is a rather interesting interaction to see. In general, his ambassadors joined Hannibal at his camp. The negotiations would drag on until next summer. Mm. And the situation in Italy would change dramatically over the coming months. Oh. Oh my. Talk about a cliffhanger. Looks like we've got a lot to look forward to. I didn't expect that little that little tidbit at the end. That's an interesting one. But overall, well, overall actually it's a complicated picture. The Romans are really struggling, especially in the Italian peninsula. They're having a bad, bad time. As we've seen, that doesn't mean that Hannibal can just sweep through to Rome, but the Romans ain't doing well. But if we take a look at Hispania, the Iberian Peninsula, Spain, whatever you want to call it, the Romans are doing better. They're at a bit of a stalemate with Hasdrubal. They have won victories in the past, but they haven't gathered a major advantage. Now it looks like they're pushing forward. They're going to go for it. So the Romans are doing a bit better <laughs> there. And now we see Philip V of Macedonia emerging. Didn't expect that. So overall, a complicated picture, but definitely not favorable to the Romans. They're having a bad, bad time. Looks like we've got some big change coming in the following episodes. And, uh, you know, this is part 14. We're actually drawing a little bit close to the end of this series. Uh, I can't remember how many parts are out. I think it's like 18 or 19 parts or something like that. But we actually only have a few more to go. And of course, this is an ongoing series. So after we get to a certain point, we'll just have to wait <laughs> until History March releases uh, a new video. But we've been making some pretty good progress. So... Uh, if you guys enjoyed this one, I would appreciate it if you would subscribe to the channel uh, and leave a like on the video. I hope you guys are having a good day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.